We're going to be in Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. This great hymn to Jesus Christ that Paul weaves into this core lesson that he gives to the church in Corinth. And the core lesson is you can't improve on Jesus. Don't try to improve on Jesus. You can't supplement Jesus with Greek philosophy. You can't supplement Jesus with Jewish uh, rituals. You, you can't grow in your Christianity by adding some Eastern mysticism to Jesus. What you can do is see Jesus more clearly and follow him more closely. Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, this great hymn to Christ. Who is Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. Doesn't that just take your breath away? To know that, that God became man. And when you looked on Jesus, they saw Jesus, God, in all God's magnificence, fully man. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Who is Jesus? He is the image of the invisible God. Who is Jesus? He is the creator and sustainer of all that exists. Verse 17. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything Jesus might be preeminent. That in everything Jesus is supreme. Why? Because he is the image of the invisible God. Because he is the creator and sustainer of all creation. And Jesus is the head of the church. The church is his body. He's the bridegroom. The church is his bride. And when we come together on the first day of every week, there's always this sense of wonder that collectively we as the church are coming collectively to be in the presence of our Lord and our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Preeminence, supremacy. And then he says in verse 8, verse 19, For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him, to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. One of the first songs that I learned as a new Christian was, There is power in the blood. Wonder working power. And then Paul has this wonderful range of words that he will use to describe the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Sometimes Paul will say the power in the blood is the power to forgive. That, ho that whole, that long, that, that list of every single sin you've ever committed that is written down in the manual in heaven, the blood of Jesus wipes that clean. Sometimes Paul will talk about it's the blood of Christ that redeems us. And the word redemption was used in the first century in the slave market. When someone would come and buy a slave, and after they purchased them, they unshackled them, and they set them free. So the blood of Jesus Christ, it forgives us, and it redeems us. But now Paul uses another word. It's a wonderful word, and here he says, It is true the blood shed on the cross that he has reconciled to himself all things. Reconciled. Reconciled is a relationship word. And now this brings to our mind the previous state of existence that we had, that we were alienated, separate, hostile from God. And Jesus has brought us back. 
And not only does he forgive us, which is wonderful, not only does he redeem us, which is wonderful, but he brings us into a, a relationship with God. That is powerful. That is wonder-working power. And then he says in verse 21, And you, and you, oh no, it's going to be trouble. Now, now we're going to get specific because if you read Colossians chapter 1 all the way through to verse 20, it's wonderful, rich theology. And Paul has kind of described who Jesus is and what we have in Jesus. And he describes Jesus and the power of, cro of the cross to reconcile all things. But now he says, and you. Now here, you can't look around and look at anyone else in the room. You can't look at that haircut in front of you and say, I don't know where they're getting their haircut, but they need a better barber. <laughs> this applies to each and every one of us. Focus specific way this morning, verse 21. And you, you, you were once alienated from God. It breaks my heart, but I know just as we've lived through this life, too many people can look back over their life and see too many relationships that now lie broken. Maybe it's a sibling that once you were so close to them, but something happened and you were far from them. Maybe it's a parent. Maybe that parent should have protected you, but instead of protecting you, they were the very person that abused you. And that relationship lies tattered. Maybe it's a child, that, that child that might be too like the prodigal child in Scripture that has been taught the ways of God but said, I don't care. I want to do things my own way. So they leave home and they leave the faith and they engage in a long time life of sin and rebellion against God. But I know that if you're here this morning, but by my own experience and by talking with so many people, we can all look back over our life and we see kind of this, this, this heartbreaking reality of broken, alienated relationships. And you, you were once alienated. And then he says, why? Because hostile in mind. Our minds didn't line up with God. We wanted to do things my own way. I've got two children. And one child, when they turned two, learned the word no. And that became the pattern of our life for quite a while. And there's many people today that constantly say no, no, no to God. There's a hostility. I don't care. I want to do things my own way. It even became almost a national anthem of America and most of the Western world in the 60s when Frank the Sinatra sang the song, I'll do things my way. And then he says, not only was that alienated from God because there was hostility in my mind, and you know in our world right now, in our culture right now, people are broken in their thinking, even about their very nature Doing evil deeds. Alienated from God, hostile in mind, and then those alienated, alienated people being hostile to God, their actions, their deeds were evil. That's what you used to be. Now look at the next verse. He has reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. What does Jesus do for alienated people, for people that are hostile to God, for people that do evil deeds against God? What did Jesus do? Jesus went to the cross to shed his blood and to give up his body so that those people who are alienated from God could be reconciled to God. And I think this is wonderful and it's powerful and it's challenging. 
Because there's this wonderful principle in Scripture. It says, first we begin with repentance. We acknowledge that we have done wrong. And then we ask for forgiveness. And following forgiveness comes <laughs> reconciliation. It is a message that our world, our culture, the United States needs to hear today is the message of repent, forgive, and be reconciled. There is power in the blood of Jesus when those who repent receive forgiveness and then they are reconciled back to God. Every time we come together on the first day of the week, there is something wondrous happening. That in spite of what we have done, in spite of our rebellion, in spite of our failures, we get to come into the presence of the Lord God Almighty. How does that happen? How does broken, alienated, hostile people who do evil deeds, how do we ever get into the presence of God? By the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. By his blood that he pours out to cleanse us. And by the spirit that he poured out on the day of Pentecost that enters into us. That allows us to cry out, Abba, Father. I think Abba, Father, that's a great word of reconciliation and relationship. But it doesn't stop there. It gets even Better. Now, I don't know about you, but this idea of being reconciled by God, it is a wonderful blessing to know that tonight, that if you're a Christian, that you can put your head on that pillow and you can go to bed, you can go to sleep, and you can be comfortable knowing I am in a right relationship with God. I am reconciled. That is wonderful. But God doesn't stop there. Look what he does next. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Now, it seems what Paul is doing here, he just takes an image out of a common first century city. And he can just imagine Paul standing in the city square and he looks over and he sees a temple. And he knows in that temple they take animals and they sacrifice these animals to the various gods. And he knows that back in the temple in Jerusalem there were animals and they were sacrificed. And now he says, Jesus, by his death, he makes us holy. And then... Not only does he make us holy, but he brings us into the presence of God. And he presents us to God as people who are holy. In order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach. Also, in that city square, they probably had one of those amphitheaters where they held their courts. And you came to the court and there'd be a trial, and at the end of the trial, if you were found innocent, they wouldn't say you were innocent. They would declare you to be blameless. So Jesus, he brings us into the presence of God after we're covered by his blood, and he says, this is now my brother, my sister, and they are holy, they are blameless. And in that city square, not only would you have a temple over on one side and the, the courtroom on another side, you probably had some of these wandering Greek philosophers who loved to talk about how we should live a good moral life and how people should be above reproach in all their dealings. And he says the only way you can be made holy, the only way you can be blameless, and the only way you can above re be above reproach is through the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's specific. And then in verse 23, he says, if, if, if. Now, when I proposed to my wife, it was head over heels. I had it bad, real bad. And she said, yes. She didn't say if, she said, yes. Now, if she had said, if you do this, I probably would have done it. 
There would have been no task that she would have given me that I would not have attempted to do. But Paul says, if, if, if. This is an important if. A few weeks ago, I got a wonderful check in the mail. Some bank, I don't know, they sent me a check for $10,000. What grace. And in a small print that says, if you cash this, you are taking a loan for $10,000. It's always a catch. If. What's the if? I want to be reconciled to God. I, I'm so glad that Jesus presents me to God as holy, blameless, and above reproach. If. If what? If you continue in the faith. Now what Paul is saying here, it's not that we work and we achieve our salvation by the work we do. Our salvation is a gift from Jesus Christ. But you better hold on to it with both hands as, as strong as you can. You better hold on to it and do not seek to add to it with philosophy or, or ritual or regulations or mysticism, which is what Paul will address in chapter 2. If you continue in the faith, walk with Jesus, keep on walking with Jesus, hold on to Jesus, and never let go if you continue in the faith. Look what he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 3 and verse 4. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Now he says in verse 23, if indeed you continue in your faith, which is in Christ Jesus, your faith that Jesus reconciled you back to God, that Jesus makes you holy, that Jesus makes you blameless, and Jesus will make you above reproach. And then he says, if you continue in the faith, stable, steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. Now, there's three interesting words right there in a collection together. Stable, steadfast, not shifting. When I read that, my mind goes to this beautiful island in the Caribbean, or the Caribbean. I forget which one we call it here in Texas. Which one is it? It's off there somewhere. It's just east of Cuba. It's the island of Hispaniola. And on that island are two nations. One is called the Dominion Republic, and that's on the east side. And on the west side is Haiti. Beautiful island. And back about 12, 13 years ago, Haiti suffered this devastating earthquake. Thousands of people died. Hundreds of thousands of people were left homeless. So many thousands upon thousands of homes just crumbled and fell down like a house of sand. And I was so proud that I was an American when that happened because the rich and the abundance outpouring of love and aid came from, that came from America was, was wonderful. Let me, let me cautiously weave through this. I know we have some problems in our country that we need to work on. And until Jesus comes back, we'll have problems to work on. But when I look at other countries around the world who like to look at America and say, you've got this problem, and then I look at the bottom line, how much money they give to Haiti, how much money they give to other countries that are in need, it is tiny comparison to what America gives. So we flooded Teddy with as much aid as we can. But also when some people there who are experts in earthquakes, and they were looking at this devastating result of this uh, earthquake. And they began to ask a question, why is it that on this island of Hispaniola that you have one island with two countries? And sometimes the, the country that we would call the Dominican Republic, it also has earthquakes, but does not near the same level of devastation, not near the same level of homelessness, not near the same level of injury and death. So they began to inspect different reasons why they might be uh, 
the difference of destruction in those countries. Turns out Haiti, it is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And when they build their houses, they are so poor that when they lay the foundation in the house, they can barely afford cement. So when they mix the concrete and the different stuff together, they use almost all sand because they can't afford any concrete cement. They're so poor that when they lay the foundation, they put no uh, reinforcing metal in the foundation. When they build the houses and they put bricks together and they put the mortar between the bricks, they're so poor, it's almost all sand. What happens when you build your house on sand and an earthquake hits it? It crumbles and it falls apart. Now, Paul uses language from earthquakes. He says, build your life. On, does this remind you of the wise men built his house upon the rock? And the foolish man built his house on sand. Or we would extend and say, not only did the wise man build his house on the rock, he built his house with rock. And the foolish man built his house with sand. And so what happens if you build your house of sand? And then there's an earthquake. He says, if indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope, three words of earthquakes. Because in about 17 AD, the city of Colossae was struck by a devastating earthquake, almost leveled the whole city. And then in AD 60, there was a minor earthquake that did some damage in the city. And Paul writes to the city of Colossae at about 62, to people who are in the city that knows what it's like to have the foundations of the very city rattled, to know what it's like to have a, an earthquake come and come almost completely destroy their city. So Paul says to them, I want you to earthquake proof your house. I have to work on that one and not stumble. I want you to earthquake proof your faith. Today, is your faith, is your walk with Jesus, is it earthquake proof? Because right now, I know from my experience and your experience that we are facing difficult times. I know we're facing them culturally, and I know that we face them individually. I know that we are going through different crises in our lives, and I hope right now that you are coming out of one of them and you're getting some relief. But I also know that some of you here are probably right in the middle of some crisis. And knowing by experience, some of us are about to enter in a crisis. If indeed you continue in the faith, are you continuing to build your house of faith on Jesus? That he is the one and the only one by his death and his burial and his resurrection that can reconcile you. That he will make you holy, declare you without fault or blemish, and he presents you to God. Do not try to supplement your faith in Jesus with anything else. Because it's like adding sand to a house that needs concrete rather than sand. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. I want to go to verse eight, uh, 28. Because Paul does this wonderful comparison on the day you became a Christian, on the day you were baptized into Christ, that's the day when Jesus Christ washed you clean, and that's the day that Jesus Christ reconciled you back to God. I mean, can you imagine coming out of that water, and now Jesus, acting like a priest, takes you, and he presents you to the Father, holy, blameless, and above reproach. That's the beginning of your walk. Look what Paul says in verse 28. Him we proclaim. Warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we might present. Now, Paul looks at his own life. 
He looks at his own ministry and he says, I'm joining with Christ. And the work that I do, I do not do the work that reconciles you. I can't make you holy. I can't make you blameless. I can't make you above reproach. But Paul says, as an apostle, as a teacher, I can help you to grow and mature in Jesus. It seems for 2,000 years, the church has known three basic principles that every Christian needs to do if they're going to grow and mature in Christ. There are three basic things that we need to do if we're going to earthquake-proof our faith. And the first one is study God's Word. So this morning, let me encourage you, if you're not doing it, to begin to read God's Word every day. Spend some time in quiet time just reading God's Word again and again and again, day by day. And if you come to passages like Leviticus, it's okay. Read it, and the next time you read it, you might understand it a little bit more. Keep on reading God's Word. Make a commitment that you're going to be here when we come together on the first day of the week for Bible class and for worship where we study God's Word. What's the first thing you've got to do if you're going to grow? You've got to study God's Word. The second thing you need to do is develop spiritual relationships. This is probably true of you, and I know it's true of my own life. When I look back over that walk of faith, and I look back at some of the Christians that walked with me in some of the most difficult days of my Christian experience, I'm so glad that they were there. Because those spiritual uh, relationships helped me to get through those difficult times. And I know this in churches. If people stick with other Christians, they stay because we get through difficult times. But what we also notice is that when people stay on the periphery of the church, when they don't get connected with other Christians, when they don't develop spiritual relationships, they're the Christians that drift away. What do you got to do if you're going to grow and earthquake-proof your faith? Study God's Word and develop spiritual relationships. That doesn't seem that hard to do. It's one more thing. You got to serve. You got to serve. The call and invitation from Jesus to obey the gospel and be saved is also a call to serve. If you're going to grow, if you're going to mature in Christ, if you're going to earthquake-proof your faith, there's three things you got to do. Study, build relationships, and serve. Let me ask you this morning, as you look at your life, how would you evaluate those three core activities that are vital for your spiritual formation. In a few moments, we're going to have a song of invitation. And when we sing that song, if you're here this morning and you're a Christian, I really want you to evaluate your study of God's Word, both personally and in the community of faith. I'm inviting you to examine your relationships with other Christians, and are you building great relationships that will help you to mature? I'm also inviting you, if you're here this morning, you're a Christian, to evaluate your service in the church and in the community. If you're here this morning and you've never met Jesus Christ in the grave of baptism this morning, we invite you to understand at the very basic level the gospel, which is that core teaching of the incarnation, God became flesh. The crucifixion, Jesus died on the cross for our sins. That he was placed in the grave and three days later he rose out of that grave to show his power over sin and death. That he ascended back into heaven where now he rules and he reigns over the church and the cosmos and one day he's coming back. The gospel is so simple, it takes work to confuse us. The gospel is the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus and you initially obeyed the gospel through your death, your burial, and your resurrection through the grave of water. You continue to obey the gospel as you study God's word, as you develop relationships, and as you serve. 
wherever you are and however you need to respond to this message, we invite you to do so as together we stand and we sing our song of encouragement. <laughs>